spent the last weekend hanging out with pastors, and the first thing that the pastors talk about when we get them in the same room is what's most important, where we're going to have lunch. Uh, the second most important thing that starts coming up is you start talking about the craft. You start talking about what you're up to, and um, you start hearing about what, what people are preaching on. And so uh, I've heard some interesting ideas and ser sermon series ideas on what to do with Paul in these days and Gospels, like what do you do with parables in Matthew. And um, most of the time when I hear people talking about interesting ideas on preaching, it's out of the New Testament. Not much of a surprise. The New Testament has the stories of Jesus, the essential, and it has the letters of Paul, which are letters to churches, and we're a church, so this seems very fitting. And the Old Testament is just different, right? The New Testament is comfortable and practical and familiar feeling, and the Old Testament just feels different. And um, so we don't get a lot of sermons out of the Old Testament. And it, there are these, these reasons make sense, right? If you look at the New Testament, it is a very multicultural type of book. Like there is the Jewish people, but then there are all the other uh, types of people floating around that Paul is going to go out and reach out to, the various Romans and Egyptians, etc. And the Jewish, uh, the Old Testament, is kind of a book by Jews, for Jews, about Jews, with Jews. It's insider baseball, right? Because we, we just heard in that reading about uh, the... the talking about Ahab, he committed the sins of Jeroboam of Nebat. And it doesn't explain, right? Do you know what the sins of Jeroboam of Nebat are? No, you're not a Jew. Like, it, it, it's insider baseball. The Old Testament is written for those who already kind of know the score. And so it's challenging to preach. There's a lot of explanation needed. Uh, the New Testament is written in the time of the Roman Empire, which it has some familiarity with today. And the Old Testament is written in the time of the Jewish kings. And we don't live in a, a kingdom. Uh, the, Old Te the New Testament is outward focused, right? Paul is going out to the nations. The Old Testament is by Jews for Jews, and really it, it's, there's not a drive to go out and reach new, new people. It, it's not the same sort of understanding of how we relate to the world. And, and I think this might be the, the most fundamental difference when it comes to preaching is, is the scope. If you think about the New Testament, Jesus is going up to people and saying, hey, will you follow me? Or, hey, are you going to come over? Or Paul will go, hey, can you come be my work with me? Right? It's about a book full of individuals making individual decisions. That's what the New Testament is full of. And the Old Testament is a book full of the stories of kingdoms and peoples. Right? The scope is so much bigger. It's beyond what we usually think about, what we usually experience. And so what happens to a lot of the stories of the Old Testament is that they are, we tell them in vacation Bible school, and so we tell the stories these of, you know, like Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, Ruth, Esther, David, Solomon, like, I could take those names, go to Google, and I could find you vacation Bible school literature for the rest of the year on those people. But if I had to find sermon series on them, well, not so much. Now... So this is what, what the challenge of preaching the Old Testament is, is that is a book, these are books focused on invasions and foreign relations and natural disasters and kings and politics. And um, to read it well, it becomes more of a challenge. Does this line up? Does this line up with y'all's experience? Anyone? Okay. Last week, we told a story of Noah, or two weeks ago. Um, Noah and the flood, and that's a natural disaster. And as I was lo working through that, thinking, how do we understand natural disasters? It, it struck me that there is a set of natural disasters I do want to share with you uh, about. There, there are two droughts that happen in the Old Testament, two uh, important droughts, and they come up in the story of Joseph and the story of, of Ahab. And I want to tell them, uh, tell you about them, but. Um, started thinking of them, but I can't promise you a satisfying ending to the sermon because, well, sometimes the Old Testament just doesn't give you a very satisfying Protestant work ethic inspired, go forth and do this. Sometimes you get to the end of the sermon, you say amen and hope it was decent. Let me know. Uh, so first, uh, Joseph. Joseph is in the story of uh, Genesis 37 to 45, and Joseph is one of the youngest sons of uh, Jacob who is renamed Israel, and uh, he is the spoiled brat of the lot. Right? He is the one who goes and he sees his brothers out working in the field, and he goes back and tattles on them to his dad when they're not working as they ought. So he's not exactly popular with his brothers. And then he shows up one day in uh, a fine coat. And uh, 
Who here has seen Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat? A few. Okay, good. All right, so I'm... <laughs> it's not an amazing Technicolor dream coat. It's not multiple colors. What it is, is it's a very finely made coat. That, that word for that coat comes, shows up one other time in Scripture to describe the outer garment that a bride wears on the day of her wedding. So, like... First of all, he's showing up to tattle on his brothers when they're not doing their work in the field. Second, he's showing up in this finery that makes it obvious that he's not going to be lending a hand. And so uh, he's not popular. And he starts showing up with these dreams and has his dreams. Like I have these the seven ears of corn or the, the 11 ears of corn are bowing down to mine. And the brothers start thinking... You got delusions of grandeur, boy? Why don't you actually work, right? And, and then he has another dream about the stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to his star. And, and it, it offends the brothers so much that when they see an empty well and they see Joseph coming, they throw him in the well. That's it. We're done with you. You're not going to tattle on us any boy, pretty boy, anymore, pretty boy. You're out of here. And so then uh, some people come by who uh, will buy and sell slaves. So they, they sell him into slavery and he's gone. And they go back and tell the dad that, sorry, he had a, a, a goat accident. We have hunting accidents and four-wheel accidents. They, they had a goat accident. And, um, which I don't really think of as a goat being all that dangerous. Maybe it is. Uh, so he is sold into slavery. He goes over to Egypt. He, he is bought by uh, Potiphar, who is the head of the guards of Pharaoh. And... Joseph makes the best of a bad situation. He, he starts managing Potiphar's household, which is good. And that's working well. And then uh, Potiphar's wife and him have a falling out. And Joseph ends up being thrown in jail by Potiphar. And again, he, he's, his life is taken a swing for the worse, but he doesn't give up. He still he makes friends with the guards and he starts helping run the jail. Um, managing the jail. And while he's there, he meets two uh, servants of Pharaoh. One servant of Pharaoh is the baker. One servant of Pharaoh is the uh, wine taster. And they both have dreams, and he interprets their dreams, and he correctly interprets that one of them is going to be executed, and one of them goes back to serve. And so after a few years, the, the Pharaoh has a dream, and the wine taster, who remembers Joseph, says, ah, there's a dude in jail. You might want to go talk to him. He can't interpret dreams. And so Joseph shows up, and um, this is the point at which you really do need to have seen the musical, because this is the point in the musical in which Pharaoh turns into Elvis. And, and around here, y'all did this recent, a couple years ago, and Kevin Blue played Elvis, and so I hear this in the voice of Elvis with Kevin Blue in shiny, shimmery, white, I, I think it's hilarious, I wish y'all had seen the musical. That's great. So uh, imagine Kevin Blue and, and Joseph having this discussion. And uh, Joseph, tell, the, the Pharaoh tells him, I had this dream of, of seven cows, fat cows, and they're walking down by the river. And then these seven scrawny cows came up. And they ate them. Oh, what does this mean? Right? And he says, but then I had another dream of seven ears of corn, nice big ears of corn. And then seven other scrawny ears of corn came up and, and ate them. What does this mean, Joseph? And I just like the fact that corn, corn is eating corn. I, I think that's great. Uh, and, and Joseph says, you are going to have seven years of bumper crops, and then you're going to have seven years of drought. And you really need someone to manage your food supply. Well, Joseph has been managing Potiphar's household, and he, then he was managing the jail, and so Pharaoh looks at him and says, well, you can manage. Why don't you do it? And so he starts managing the food supply of Egypt, and when the drought hits, uh, the brothers, the, the 11 brothers, the family, they, they're, they're running out of food, and so they come down to Egypt where they have plenty of food, and then they bow down, uh, fulfilling that dream, and they bow down to uh, Joseph, and after two song and dance numbers, there's a joyful fam family reunion, and then the grand finale, and that's the end of that, that story. And, and so... Uh, Joseph sort of told, tells his brothers, what you meant for evil, God used for good. Do not be angry. God sent me ahead to save lives. And so the end of that story is God has used me to save lives for the, knowing the drought is coming. The other story we started this morning was uh, of King Ahab, and there is no musical to go with the story of King Ahab. Instead, it is the story of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, is Jezebel still used as an insult? 
Is that still? Y'all know that's not exactly a compliment. You sell call someone a Jezebel. But this is the original Jezebel. This is the Jezebel that gives all other Jezebels the, the bad name. That's why no one ever names their kids Jezebel. I hope not. Uh, but um, Ahab is a craven, self-centered, greedy bum who is also king. And he marries someone who is his match. And she uh, tells him to do some things that really just ought not to be done. At one point, she tell, he, he wants a vineyard in the center of the city. And she says, well, take it. And tells him to go kill the owner. And have, it, have uh, the courts rigged so that he'll be executed for... Um, Heresy, for, and so it, it, she is really not a good influence. And, and so Ahab is told by the prophet Elijah that there is a drought coming. Drought, natural phenomena, it happens, right? Uh, and he is told the drought is coming, and he ignores the prophet. He ignores the news that the drought is coming, and instead he goes to his yes-men. He has filled up his, his cabinet, so to speak, with yes-men, people who will tell him, yeah, the, the crops are going to be great. Yeah, the economy is going to be good. Yeah, the unemployment is going to be wonderful. And yeah, no one's going to invade. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a temptation, right, to surround yourself with people who say yes. And so Ahab has surrounded himself with people who tell him yes. And so when the drought begins, there have been no preparations. And so for two or three years, there is no rain. There is no crop, and it just gets bad. And it, this, this comes to a conclusion when Ahab and Elijah have their confrontation, and Ahab uh, is challenged to bring his priests, the 450 priests, priests of Baal, and they... Uh, they sacrifice an ox, and, and, and Elisha sacrifices an ox, and, and, and they try to call down fire to accept the sacrifice, and, and it doesn't happen. And Elijah looks over at them as they're trying to call down fire and starts hollering, Hey, you might need to holler louder. Your God might be in the bathroom. It's, uh, he's like snarking at them as they're trying to pray. It's, uh, it's a great moment in Scripture. But, uh, and then Elijah prays, and the fire comes down and takes the offering, and then the rain comes. And this ends the story of the drought, the famine under Ahab. And you think that after this, Ahab might learn his lesson. He doesn't. He invades a foreign country. He keeps on stealing. He ends up dying in battle miserably. So there, there you are. Those are the two other uh, of the major sort of natural disasters in, in the Old Testament. Now you've heard most of them. I don't, don't think there's any other. There's the flood and then there's the two droughts. And so what do we make of these two droughts? Now the problem of preaching on drought is that there's nothing you can do about drought, is there? Right? A great sermon ends in, uh, now you go forth and you do something. Does anyone here have any ability to do something about drought? Right? No, not really. And, and so we can discuss a bit about natural disasters, that they're natural and they're going to happen. And so we might as well plan for them and be prepared, be more like Joseph than, than like Ahab. Good. But... Um, let me give you a, a set of options for conclusion. Anyone here read Choose Your Own Adventure books growing up? Read those to you? Good. <laughs> Someone's with me. Good. Uh, choose Your Own Adventure. I'll, I'll let, give you four endings. You choose which one you think works best. First way you could end a sermon like this is to say, choose good leaders. You got to good, choose good leaders. Pharaoh is a good leader because he listens, and Ahab is a bad leader because he doesn't. And so we have to be very careful about choosing good leaders because a, a leader who does not listen is going to lead in a way that people are going to suffer. Okay, that's one way maybe to end it. Here's a second way. If you ever end up leading, when you end up leading, you better be listening because someone's going to tell you something that someone's going to go wrong and they might be right. So if you ever find yourself in the position of leadership, be sure to be listening to the people who tell you bad news. That's the one idea. Here's another. Uh, let's just continue to pray that those who are leading are listening. Let us continue to pray for the leaders in our community, the leaders in our nation, the leaders worldwide, that those who lead are humble enough to listen and know when they might be falling short. And, and maybe here's the fourth ending, and this is the generic ending you can put on any, any sermon. The kingdom of God is coming. Right? In the end, we know the punchline, the kingdom of God is coming, and in the end, we are heading towards a time when drought is not going to be a concern, when the leaders will be good, for we will all bow uh, in front of Jesus Christ, the best and ultimate leader. And in the end, the kingdom will come, and we will all uh, we will just have to worry about droughts, and we will all bask in the presence of God.
So there's your endings on a frustrating topic on a frustrating sermon. Let me know which one you thought looked best. Amen.